Thank you so much, Ian. And and is uh, my screen sharing okay? Everyone can see it. Yes, I can, we can see it. Yeah. Perfect. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that warm introduction. I'm I'm really pleased, and I'm I'm always excited to connect with Ian again. We, yes, we we had an interesting conversation back in the day when uh, the conversation about psychedelics was very different, I think, than some of the conversations that are taking place today. So. I'm going to, I kind of made a, a decision this morning, at least my morning time, uh, when I reached out to Ian after he sent me a paper and I thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to try this out. This is a paper, or this is a presentation that I've been working on that's not fully ironed out yet, um, but I, I, I'm going to give this a try. So um, instead of giving a sort of overview of the history, what I want to do is take a historian's look at the psychedelic renaissance. So there's a little bit more contemporary material in here, but also I want to make a plug for why it's important to think historically about some of the questions that I think are resurfacing today and some of those debates that Ian alluded to as well. And also maybe we should talk about ketamine later, but uh, I'll leave that for <laughs> discussion. All right, I'm going to check my time here to make sure I don't go too far. Um, the image that I have here looks kind of like a mess, um, but I want to just uh, let you know where this comes from. This is um, a collage that was put together by Ken Kesey. Some of you may know him as the author of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. You know, that's probably his most famous um, piece, his most famous piece of writing. Um, and some of you may or may not know that he served time in a jail in California and beginning in 1967 after being um, busted with well a variety of things, including psychedelic products, but also cannabis and what else. And he created this set of collages. And so I wanted to sort of draw attention to this as one of one of the key figures in psychedelics and where things were historically, at least sort of going off the rails a little bit. I'm not sure if there's someone that's not muted, but I'm getting quite a bit of feedback from. Yeah, um, I think just bear with us one, one moment. Uh, it's uh, Kinga Noble. Kinga, could, could you mute yourself for us, please? Is that possible? Uh, well, I will carry on and hopefully it'll work. All right, so here's my own history. This is a, a young version of me when I was still completing my PhD at McMaster University in 2005, where I boldly and rather naively and without thinking um, said that, you know, LSD may become a valid area of psychiatric research. This was published in the, you know, the McMaster newsletter in 2005, and it kind of ricocheted through the press in ways that certainly were unexpected to me as a PhD student. And I just want to highlight this because um, 2005 is somewhat early, and I'd like to claim that I'm responsible for what happened next, but I certainly am not. If we look through um, Google Scholar, for example, or if we look through PubMed or um, different uh, aggregate um, publications, beginning in 2006, 2007, and then really exploding from 2010 forward, um, we start to see a number of scientific publications re-questioning the value of psychedelics in this space. That is psychiatric space and a therapeutic space, uh, not really in a recreational space just yet, um, but we see leading units like Johns Hopkins unit led here by Roland Griffiths. Um, there's also Imperial College. I'll talk about David Nutt in a moment, there are a number of research institutes that begin to kind of reevaluate psychedelics. Here's David Nutt. Um, in 2007, David Nutt published an article in The Lancet where he suggested that the British Food and Drug Administration, her advisory uh, group, had wrongheadedly identified the kinds of risks associated with different psychoactive products. Um, so for, I know Ian and I have talked about this at some length, but putting alcohol at one end of that spectrum, suggesting that it's actually much, much more expensive to healthcare systems when people have an addiction associated with alcohol and psychedelics have been associated with high risks and yet they are not addictive and don't have the same kind of financial implications when it comes to healthcare risks. If you know uh, David Nutt, you will know that he was promptly sacked um, and is now head of, of the Neuroscience Research Unit at um, Imperial College, where he has quite a robust team, including, um, until quite recently, Robin Carhart Harris, who was, I have on good authority, has moved to California. But anyway, he has quite a robust team of researchers there, bringing together some of the neuroscience research and really pushing policy in this area. <laughs> 
But there are a number of research units also sort of staking claims or creating space here. And I think what I'm going to try to do today is, is look a little bit about how they are claiming that expertise and what kind of evidence they're using to push this psychedelic agenda forward. So Johns Hopkins University uh, at, in, uh, at Baltimore is one of them. Uh, Berkeley has a science center. If you're familiar with Michael Pollan's work, he has donated some funds and social capital to this uh, Berkeley Institute that is really focused a lot more on creating connections with journalists and creating some of the narratives around um, around psychedelics. So different from the psychiatric research that's going on or the neuroscience based research that's taking place at Johns Hopkins and the policy stuff. I'm simplifying, but a lot of the sort of policy forward research that's coming out of Imperial College in London, that is. Um, I'm Canadian, so I'm going to, you know, force you to learn something about Canada. Um, Canada has been a little bit slower, but has started creating research chairs at major universities, creating psychedelic research chairs. Now, if you told me this 10 years ago, I probably wouldn't believe it. Um, this landscape is changing quickly. And to have endowed chairs now at major medical doctoral universities with um, psychedelics in the title is something quite unheard of. Um, over the past, say, 60 to 70 years. There are also, though, outside of those public institutions, there are a number of philanthropic, not-for-profit, or hybrid kinds of organizations that are starting to function as major lobby groups. The largest one in the world right now is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, or MAPS. MAPS has been eagerly pushing this agenda forward and has been sort of the key broker in convincing the FDA that some psychedelics, here's a headline for MDMA or ecstasy, MDMA 3,4-methylene dioxymethamphetamine, let's see if I can say that a few times, I'll call it MDMA, um, received breakthrough status in 2017 for PTSD. And this was a clinical trial that was done with um, Marines from the US Marine Corps. So veterans primarily, not those in active service. And not long after that, another organization, another US um, organization was granted uh, breakthrough status for psilocybin for major depression. Um, treatment resistant depression is another category that's getting a lot of attention with clinical trials right now. And as Ian mentioned, there's also some with palliative care, which I'll speak about in a moment. So there are clinical trials rolling forward. Right now, the focus is on psilocybin, mushrooms, and MDMA or ecstasy. We also see um, some DMT work taking place, certainly a lot of ketamine work, which fits in a different category. Um, but there's start, we're starting to see psychedelics sort of filling into these legitimate clinical trials. In this slide, I wanted to draw attention also to some of the changes in the policy area. In Canada, we're seeing this at the municipal and provincial or territorial level with some slower uptake at the federal point. In the United States, though, of course, with a very different political arrangement, we're starting to see a lot of initiatives at the municipal level. So Denver, for example, has um, decriminalized a variety of things, including psilocybin mushrooms. They were one of the first, if you recall, to decriminalize cannabis. Uh, Vancouver in Canada is um, haven't really passed formal policy, but municipally, they are turning a blind eye to the sale of mushrooms in head shops under a certain category. So not huge amounts, small amounts, so not for clinical trial purposes or for major distribution. The entire state of Oregon has been, was the first American state at a state level to decriminalize psychedelic plants. Now this plants and fungi, I should say. This mostly affects things around like cannabis and mushrooms. So LSD is not allowed under this under these um, criteria. What I wanna emphasize here is just that there's a real patchwork of things happening. There doesn't seem to be consensus on how this should be done, whether this should be done, or whether it should be a policy initiative that looks more like what we've seen in the cannabis side of things, or whether it should be confined to medical or healthcare um, domains. I've got to, I'm gonna go through this rather quickly because it's just to give you a couple of examples. Here's Oregon, but, and I should say, I should back that up for one second. Um, in Canada, the province of Alberta, um, trying to think of something interesting uh, where the Edmonton Oilers are from. I don't know, I'm trying to think of some like, <laughs> some place to, some way to anchor Alberta for you. Uh, Alberta um, has just recently made a change beginning, it was effective January 15th, so just a few days ago. Uh, registered psychiatrists in Alberta can now 
legally access psychedelics for uh, their treatment protocols. They, there's no specific designation. It's not for major depression, for example, or for palliative conditions, um, but it, the onus is on psychiatrists to make the determination as to whether or not psychedelics are appropriate for their um, treatment regimen. This is kind of precedent setting in Canada and it has the potential to change some of these conversations elsewhere. But I'm gonna to suggest to you that it's not just the policy and the science piece or the, or the policy and the healthcare pieces, but there's a lot of conversation that's taking place that's sort of untethered from those conversations, or at least are not accountable to the same research ethics boards or research funding decisions. So the chief among those I think would be Michael Pollan, who's you know food critic turned psychedelic expert um, has launched this multi-million dollar or sorry multi-million reader uh best-selling book that has now been serialized in a documentary and this kind of first-hand expertise if you, anybody's read the book or or um, watched the documentary he goes through a variety of psychedelics himself and you follow him on this journey as he tries these different experiences and it's almost like a celebrity testimonial about these kinds of experiences and you kind of get an idea of it. It's rather titillating at times. I think it's probably more on the this is fun and exciting side of things than the we should proceed with caution. Um, but this kind of attention to psychedelics is, I think, changing public attitudes, perhaps even more so than what's happening in our clinical trials or at the policy level discussions. Michael Pollan is one, and maybe you're really excited because he's Michael J. Fox's brother-in-law, but even more importantly, perhaps if you're an NFL football fan, you know, star quarterback, I think he's won some rings. I, I don't actually follow that much. Um, Aaron Rodgers claims that ayahuasca set him on a journey of leadership in his uh, star-studded career and, you know, multi-million dollar contract career as a quarterback. Uh, Mark Messier, there's my Alberta content again. You may have heard of this uh, hockey player who at one time was a captain, co-captain with Wayne Gretzky and went on to win six Stanley Cups. Um, this guy who was drafted at the same time as Gretzky had to share the stage with this, you know, great hockey player, his nickname being the great one. Um, and he He's talked openly now about how his trips with mushrooms throughout that period of his life allowed him to be the kind of leader that he needed to be sharing the stage with this other amazing hockey player. These really kind of introspective moments that are shared by these guys who have otherwise been real icons of kind of like macho masculinity, you know, these tough, maybe thick headed even um, hockey players, football ball stars, NFL stars who were talking about this softer, gentler side of them that allowed them to sort of uh, model forms of good leadership. Another, I'd say, tough, probably soft-headed now guy, uh, Mike Tyson, um, also claims that his 5-MeO-DMT um, experience, this is from the toad venom, uh, when he smoked psychedelic toad venom, he experienced a kind of spiritual death, and this too gave him great insight. And so you have these kinds of um, iconic figures from popular culture showing up and claiming that these drugs, these experiences, have given them life-changing experiences. Oh yeah, not to be outdone. Some nerds have taken it too, if you allow me to call Steve Jobs a nerd. So, you know, engineer, obviously, uh, again, a famous um, co-founder, uh, founder rather, of Apple Computers claims that, you know, LSD was one of the most important things in his life. And if you go on to read the interview that was done by a biographer, he talks about LSD giving him the courage to try different things when it came to computer engineering. These are just a few examples, and there are many more of these, some of whom are coming forward now, claiming to have taken psychedelics in the past, and others who are now seeking those experiences as they explore other ways of being innovative. Like I said, I think there's a lot of policy changes on the horizon. Some of these are stutter steps. You see a couple steps forward, a couple steps back. Um, but there are a number of jurisdictions that are starting to experiment with different ways of organizing regulations to allow for psychedelics, some with more harm reduction in mind, and others, I think, with more libertarianism. I'll, I'll go to the left coast in, in North America for that. 
Health Canada, um, as in our federalist state, is you know the overseer of this uh, of all of the things that are going on in Canada when it comes to psychedelic regulation in the healthcare industry. Again, separate now from where cannabis sits. Health Canada has been doing a case by case review of applications for psychedelics until this Alberta precedent has been set, which, like I said, is only a few days old. So as a historian, I'm not really equipped to comment on that. Um, but Health Canada has been slowly watching this space, but not making any large pronouncements. And that's what most jurisdictions are doing right now. They're not making these kind of overwhelming or big statements, um, which I think is probably good. But what they have done is started providing dealers licenses to a variety of um, industrial partners here in Canada, but also you can see this happening in the United States with the capacity to now develop more psychedelics. So um, synthetics in particular, mushroom grow ups, um, but also psilocybin synthetics, ketamine, et cetera. All right, so that's as much as I am going to say at the moment about the sort of contemporary situation before I wanna sort of take a step back and go into more of my own comfort zone, which is the historical part. Um, I think, you know, Ben Sasa, who's a child psychologist in, sorry, a child psychiatrist in, in England, um, he has coined this phrase of the, psych, the psychedelic renaissance. And what I want to do is sort of unpack that a little bit. So what is it that we are trying to recover or rediscover or, uh, you know, reclaim uh, from the past and sort of move that forward? If we think about the history of psychedelics, there are a variety of competing origin stories that might help us or, or maybe destabilize it, us in thinking about what it, what it is, what path are we actually on, even if there is one singular path. There are laboratory origins, and we can think of the introduction of LSD, D-lysergic acid diethylamide 25, which was um, in Basel, Switzerland. And the picture on the top left there is Albert Hoffman, who is the sort of father of LSD, if you will. We can think about ethnobotanists, Richard Schultes is pictured in the middle there, whose voyages through much of the Amazon basin and throughout a tremendous areas in Central and South America, tried to reconnect psychoactive substances and plants in particular with the kinds of rituals and customs that people practiced as they harnessed the capacity of plants to provide insights, often described more as spiritual, but this overlaps very neatly with health um, transformations as well. We looked, we can see archaeological evidence in places, especially in Mexico, but also again through Central and Latin, most of Latin America. We see recognition of older uh, statues and iconography suggesting that, you know, mushrooms have been part of ancient cultures, indigenous cultures. And I'll, I'll skip on and explain some of these other ones in, in subsequent slides. What I mean by this is that the topic of psychedelics, I don't think, is something that we can comfortably say only fits into a lab-based story or an Indigenous story or sort of ancient wisdom and tradition story. I think there are a variety of different um, narratives that feed this, and, and maybe we need to question that as we think about what it is we're trying to preserve going forward. Um, I'm in the process of working on a book on the global history of psychedelics, uh, and by, by working on it, I mean I'm editing other people's brilliant work. Um, and what we wanted to do as part of that is capture, you know, where do psychedelics start and where do they go to if we look only at um, available information through PubMed. So if you go through a kind of scientific window, what we see are, and so we've created these maps, um, and hopefully what you recognize quickly with these maps is like there are places that maybe should be there and aren't or places that are on there that you were surprised to see. What we found was that by going through that sort of um, digitally available scientific evidence that has been made available online, um, we miss a lot of the story. And, you know, unfortunately for any of you who are in the classroom, I mean, this is where a lot of our students are getting information from, you know, if it's not online, it didn't happen. Um, and, you know, obviously, I don't believe that that's the case, but what we wanted to do is try to present this as a way of understanding that there are certain narratives and certain ways of understanding this history that have been reinforced partly by the availability of evidence, and then also from the lack of availability of other forms of evidence, both because, you know, PubMed goes back to about 1965, <laughs> and there was a lot of psychedelic research before that. And we can do the same thing with uh, peyote, psilocybin mushrooms, peyote and mescaline are, are related, of course, mescaline, one of the alkaloids in peyote, and ayahuasca, and we've collapsed that with DMT here as well, although I recognize there are other psychoactive alkaloids there as well. 
Those are just to give you a quick sense of some of the flows of information. And in the pre-digital age, these flows of information have been tracked through correspondence and from people traveling. So again, there's a lot of gaps in this information, but it just gives you a quick, just a quick sense. You can also see, I'll do this for um, for Marcus's benefit, that um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of interest in what's going on in the German pharmaceutical industry at this time, and so there's a lot of overlap there. And I'd love to drill down and chat with you more about some of the or some of those um, crossovers. If we go to some of um, medical history on psychedelics, we kind of have to move beyond psychedelics. The word itself isn't coined until 1957 officially, first uttered in 1956. But there are lots of stories and narratives and historical claims about these kinds of experiences that when we look back at, we might want to claim them as psychedelic experiences. Um, St. Anthony's fire, ergot poisoning is of course one of the notorious stories connected here. Um, and we know that ergot was what um, Albert Hoffman was attempting to synthesize when he was working at Sandoz Pharmaceuticals and came up with LSD. So it is an ergotine, ergotamine derivative. But there are other examples too, and I'm, I'm going to just quickly uh, identify, you know, there's a Peruvian and there are also evidence in Bolivia of the San Pedro cactus being honored and used in these spiritual ceremonies to bring forth insights and wisdom. There are Egyptian examples of using mushrooms, which people claim may have been in fact psilocybin mushrooms, honoring particular forms of wisdom and usually preserved for the pharaohs um, to have sort of direct conversation with gods. So if we move beyond the scientific evidence, we get we get a different kind of picture is all that I'm trying to emphasize there. And certainly throughout the late 19th and early 20th century, anthropologists played a huge role in helping to furnish the kind of evidence and stories that we had and, and illustrations in, as well about plant, um, the relationship between plants and medicines or plants and chemistry. And perhaps amongst the most famous, the sort of father of ethnobotany, Richard Schultes, who was a Harvard professor, really well known for his studies throughout this, um, throughout Latin America. And uh, in reviewing some of his work, I can't imagine what it'd be like to apply to your dean to go and hang out in a canoe for several months and not have any access whatsoever and maybe write a paper or not. But anyway, some pretty cool voyages if you, if you think about it. The kind of ethnography, ethnobotany, anthropology created a different line, I think, or a different discipline, really, or, or set of sub disciplines for trying to understand this relationship between indigenous rituals that's tied into colonialism, um, but also customs and practices that contributed to different cosmologies, different theories of understanding about illness, trauma, hallucination, insight, distress. A lot of these words don't even fit necessarily into those categories, and yet there's a robust set of theories that are, are, are developed in, in a number of these studies. Now, these are mostly non-Indigenous um, anthropologists or observers coming in and writing this. Um, but throughout the early, early 20th century, um, there's, there are quite a few studies done of going into these Indigenous communities to try to understand these, the relationship between hallucination, for example, and health or spirituality. But as those anthropologists were doing you know, amazing work, um, there's also a kind of competition, if you will, or maybe it wasn't even an open competition, but there's another um, kind of momentum within chemistry um, and the rising tide of pharmaceutical work and pharmacology that's trying to pull apart the chemicals or the alkaloids from the plants. And it creates a different, not only a different narrative, but different interpretations or different implications for how we understand the value of these substances and the experiences that accompany them. And just as a, as a example, this is certainly not comprehensive, but we can recognize these kind of key moments in you know, isolating particular alkaloids or chemicals from their plant hosts or from the plants. Now, according to a number of um, Indigenous historians, you know, this actually kind of ruins it, of course. It, it, it completely changes the experience. If, for example, you take mescaline out of peyote and you don't have to throw up all the fibrous bits that you've just eaten with the peyote, you're having a very different experience. Your relationship to the plant is quite different and your relationship to the experience. You know, you may be less deferential to something if you haven't heaved your guts out. Uh, those are my words, not theirs. Um, but 
all of that kind of interaction with the plants, including identifying the plants, knowing the plants, harvesting them at the right time, um, all of that is lost in the process of extraction and isolation, which can potentially create a kind of quick fix. It can create a commercial opportunity. You can imagine a variety of different implications here. By the mid 20th century, the pharmaceutical industry, and I'm sure I don't have to belabor this point to anyone here, um, is really amidst a paradigmatic shift within, the, within psychiatry. Um, psychopharmaceuticals are of course now, beginning in the 1950s, some of the sort of first stop um, solutions or remedies. And, and you know, we're moving very quickly into this pharmaceutical paradigm or psychopharmaceutical paradigm. These are a few examples from a project I'm doing with um, my colleague, Matt Savelli, where we're trying to sort of track psychoactivity over how psychoactivity has been sold um, over the 20th century. Suffice to say, a number of people, including pharmacologist David Healy, argues that you know in the 1950s, the switch to pharma pharmaceuticals creates a revolution, both in psychiatry and in the way that we, the language that we use to describe psychiatric distress. And psychedelics fit into that moment. You know, the, this relationship between plants and psychoactive experiences and the desire to create a kind of chemical, even synthetic, um, way of under of encapsulating psychedelics um, comes in around the same time. I won't belabor this because I've, I've just been proofreading this paper that's so fascinating that I'm going to try to keep it to a few sentences, but it's so interesting. You should all learn German and read Biat Bachi's excellent work on this topic. Um, he talks about the way that Sandoz moves from looking at ergot as a gynecological, as a potential gynecological medicine to investing in psychedelic research. Um, and Albert Hoffman is key to that story. Albert Hoffman is considered not only, you know, this godfather, this father of psychedelics, or this father of LSD at least, but he's also become this mythical character in this history. The guy who, you know, synthesized LSD in 1938, um, as Swiss, uh, Switzerland was a neutral during the war and taking advantage of the fact that Germany was kind of hobbled in their pharmaceutical production at the time. But perhaps amongst the most famous pieces and what some of those guys were wearing on their backpacks that Ian saw was this uh, tribute to his bicycle day experience, which on April 19th, he had the first intentional psychedelic experience. He had one the day before, but that was by accident. The next day, he intentionally took some LSD to, in an effort to try to understand what effects it might have on him. And he describes this beautifully in his book, LSD, My Problem Child, and his lab assistant, Susie Ramstein, took notes while he hopped on his bicycle after taking 250 micrograms of LSD and uh, felt that he had this overpowering sense of synesthesia, that he could feel his legs on the bicycle, but the road was rippling and yawning. He thought he'd been plunged into a Salvador Dali painting, and he started to have vivid hallucinations. Quite, he even questioned whether these were permanent, whether he'd driven himself insane or mad. And he started sort of falling into these um, hallucinations and, and paranoia set in. After about five or six hours, he'd, he'd locked himself in a room in his house at this point. Um, he relaxed into the experience a bit more and felt a kind of overwhelming. He felt that he was bathed in, in beauty um, and really appreciated the lights and the colors and the dancing kind of visuals that he was having. So by Bicycle day is something that a lot of psychedelic societies are now celebrating, some of this more underground than others, and, you know, real aficionados will celebrate this from the 70s onwards. Um, but if you go and Google Albert Hoffman and Bicycle Day, you can see, you know, April 19th is the famous day when he went on his bicycle and then introduced psych uh, LSD to the world. LSD came to Saskatchewan in um, 1944, and I want to be mindful of time and, and keep kind of going through this quickly, but I would be remiss if I didn't point out that our Scottish born premier, Tommy Douglas, uh, was elected in Saskatchewan in 1944 on the promise to reform healthcare in Canada, starting with the province. This was the introduction of our publicly funded healthcare system and Douglas from Selkirk, I believe, um, was both health minister and premier at the time. And in his role as health minister and premier, 
He recruited a number of researchers to the province to invest in major healthcare reforms. One of those people, our person for today, is uh, Humphrey Osmond, and he's the man who ultimately coins the word psychedelics and starts a, a whole set of research um, projects in Saskatchewan beginning in 1951. In 1953, that research was well underway, and he had developed at least two different arms of the research, and this is, of course, supported by other faculty and, and uh, colleagues. One was the idea that LSD, mescaline, and later they added psilocybin to this, created a model psychosis. This is a way for psychiatric nurses and researchers and psychiatrists to appreciate what it's like to experience, at least as he put it at the time, schizophrenia. Now, there are problems with this model, and we can debate those or discuss them, um, but this was one aspect of the research. The idea that staff or people working in major psychiatric institutions should take LSD, usually, it was the cheapest and the most powerful, um, as a way of empathizing with patients who seem to have lost their capacity to connect, um, to verbalize some of their experiences, and who often seem to be sort of um, alienated from their environment. They stayed in their rooms, they weren't connecting with people. That's one arm. And the second piece, which Ian's already alluded to, is the treatment for alcoholism. Initially, they thought that drugs like LSD might bring someone to a simulated rock bottom experience. It would get them to the place where they could seek help. They would appreciate the insight that, you know, they could not go on like this, um, but it would be set up in a, in a way that almost scared them. That turned out not to be the case. In fact, they went through jails and referrals, and I should say there were consent forms for all of these uh, trials as well. And they found that people didn't have a sort of scary, terrible experience. They had really nice experiences, even ones that they glowed about. They really enjoyed them. They wanted to have them again. Um, and, and I'll come to that in, in just a moment, the implications of that. Shortly after they started publishing, they began publishing on this in 1951. That's when they first started their model psychosis research. And by 1953, it had started to attract a variety of attention. Again, pre-digital era. So this is, you know, by letters and, and um, off prints and whatnot. And Aldous Huxley was one of the people who, who came to their attention. He wanted to try and experience himself. So Humphrey Osmond drove from Saskatchewan to Los Angeles with mescaline and brought mescaline to the famous... Um, writer, and I should mention that both um, both of these men grew up in the same um, the same place in England, um, and the name of it will come to me at some point during this presentation because I just can't remember off the top of my head. Um, Surrey, there, they're from Surrey. Um, so he took masculine to Aldous Huxley, worried that well, he was a bit trepidatious about this whole ex experience, but it turned out that of course this brilliant and erudite writer was very enchanted by the experience that he had, and within a month he drafted the first um, edition of The Doors of Perception. And this book became the first guidebook used by a number of psychedelic researchers beginning in 1954 when it was published, um, as they were trying to introduce people to the kinds of things you might expect in this wild world of psychedelics, or I shouldn't use the word psychedelic, it wasn't coined yet, in this wild world of mescaline and LSD research, where syn synesthesia often overwhelms the capacity to communicate clearly or in a way that seems rational. They became fast friends and for the next 10 years or until Huxley's death in 1963, um, they wrote letters quite frequently. They had some visits, but they have a lot of letters. And I'm pleased to say that we've been able to publish a complete set of the letters. So we have both sides of the exchange. What's interesting to me here, and I hope perhaps to you, is when they first come up with the word psychedelic. On the left-hand side is Aldous Huxley's writing, um, and I'll, I'll skip to the rhyming couplet there. He says, to make this trivial world sublime, take half a gram of phenarethyme. Um, and Humphrey Osmond writes in the bottom, they have quite different uh, scripts, so you can tell them apart, to plumb the depths or soar angelic, just take a pinch of psychedelic. And he plays with this a few different times. You can see different Googleable versions of this. Uh, many of them were written by Osmond. They wanted to capture this word psychedelic that as he puts in the, on, you can see it on the right-hand side, delos from the Greek word to manifest or bring to light. They didn't wanna tip their hat, so to speak, to the psychopharmacologists or necessarily even to a particular theory within psychiatry at this time, but they wanted it to be a kind of open association that blended different ideas. It wasn't overly psychoanalytical, but to bring something to light had 
real power, they thought. And it's interesting to me that the word has stuck. There were a number of rival terms, but this one stuck. They also um, participated in some Native American church ceremonies. And you may know that the Native American church had legal access to peyote. There was one branch in Canada and several in the United States. Um, Aldous Huxley also participated in some of these in California. And I'm gonna just keep going here. Um, and their work began to attract attention from others as well, including, I'm sure this man needs no introduction, Bill uh, Wilson, of course, from Alcoholics Anonymous, who quietly put his pocket. Sorry, I'm getting feedback again. Is there a, somebody muted? Kinga, you're, you're on, um, can you mute yourself, please? Cool. Um, Bill Wilson had his own LSD experience, uh, which of course he didn't want to advertise or publicize at the time that he was the sole um, remaining member of, of as co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous and still subscribed to an abstinence model of addiction. But he felt that it was actually quite helpful to get people to start with Alcoholics Anonymous. And particularly he seized upon this step two. This is from the 1955 version of the, the big book. Um, where he suggested that there was a spiritual dimension that was possible through psychedelics that was difficult to recreate in other forms. And in fact, some people would start AA and then they wouldn't stay with the program, but those who tried psychedelics were more likely to stay with the program. And I believe, um, I'm, I can't prove this entirely, but I believe that the clinical trials that were done with psychedelics psychedelics in partnership with AA had much better results than any of the other ones because they combined these elements of, in this case, group therapy. It wasn't psychotherapy per se, but that combination of things. And I'm again, I'd be really curious what you all think. So some people started going down this spiritual angle. Is it the spiritual piece that draws people in? Is it what keeps them in? And there have been a few different studies on this. Um, but what they found by the late 1950s was that patients being treated for alcoholism using a combination of psychedelics, often LSD and either AA, sometimes not identified, or forms of group therapy had 30 to 90% success rates with two-year follow-ups. And I should say again, the two-year follow-ups were made possible in large part because people had joined these other groups. It was through that group connection that they were allowed to do or that they could maintain those follow-ups and people weren't lost to the study. All right, sorry, I can talk about this all day. So I'm gonna to try to speed up. 1962, things start to come off the rails. And I will argue that it is not Timothy Leary's fault in 1962 necessarily, or the Grateful Dead, or I don't know, any other kind of um, cultural moment. But I think there's a combination of both a cultural questioning as well as a scientific questioning of the place of chemicals in our lives, including in our environments, which is why I put um, Silent Spring up there as a reminder. Thalidomide also shook the public confidence in the capacity for researchers and policymakers to make the right decisions about whether to approve pharmaceuticals or how to evaluate risk particularly for populations like we might say pregnant women, um, but there are a variety of underserved populations who also kind of those stories start to come to the fore beginning here. And of course, over time, we see this with Tuskegee or experiments in Guatemala, et cetera. At the same time that, um, you know, so there's a lot of pressure on policymakers at this point to come up with robust methods for evaluating risk, minimizing risk. And at the same time, randomized controlled trials are beginning to, um, they're, they're not, I mean, streptomycin research was done in the 1930s, but the double blind clinical trial and the randomized controlled trial does not really become the gold standard until around the same time, partly to minimize risk, but also to create a kind of scalable way of measuring these substances. But also in 1963, January of 1963, this Harvard trained psychologist loses his job uh, for a variety of reasons that different biographers have um, put out different theories, like sleeping with his students or not sleeping with his wife or taking psychedelics with his um, with the uh, jail prisoners that he was studying or crossing borders in Mexico with cannabis in his pocket. There's a variety of reasons why this guy was, you know, not behaving well. 
Nonetheless, he doesn't go away quietly. He, of course, is catapulted into the public spotlight, not as a Harvard psychologist now, you know, who is responsible to research ethics boards or responsible to hiring committees and tenure committees, but now he's sort of put himself out there as a media darling who is ready to take on the state and anybody who looks at him and encourage us to all to turn on, turn on, tune in and drop out. That is sort of unshackle ourselves from those maybe um, systems of oversight. Clinical trials at this time change. Um, these reasons for the, the thalidomide story, for the other kinds of suggestions here that, you know, psychedelics are beginning to be a household name. Acid certainly is becoming a household name. And what people like Osmond say is that he could no longer run a good trial because now he has people who are coming in with their own musical selections. They have their own expectations about how the experience should go. And in fact, they feel really pissed off if they don't see Nirvana uh, over the course of this clinical trial. Researchers are really confounded by this. They said they can't get good evidence um, and they're getting the wrong kinds of volunteers. They want volunteers want a safe room and the researchers want naive drug takers, if you will. And this starts to this starts to kind of pull things apart. California and New York are the first in North America to put clamps to clamp down on this by declaring psychedelics to be illegal largely claiming to be in reaction to the cultural flamboyance of psychedelic drug taking, Grateful Dead concerts, etc. And at the same time that psychedelics become illegal in these two notorious states, um, we, rec we know that there is be the beginnings of an underground market, blotter acid, acid that is being distributed on paper and it is being produced not by Sandoz, but by, it turns out, one of the roadies from the Grateful dead and it turns out by enterprising chemists who have figured out ways of distributing lsd on pieces of paper and that there's a fascinating history here that somebody else is writing um his name is eric i'll think of his last name uh, about the history of blotter acid that i encourage you all to check out once once it's available one of the people who is the, um, the, the biggest world collector of uh, blotter acid um, is mark mcleod pictured down here who i had the pleasure of interviewing a few years ago um, and he's really tracked this history showing that, you know, the, they even chemists worked with artists as a really kind of subversive way of bringing acid to the masses, sometimes not even taking payment for it. Some even claimed sort of boldly that they were undermining pharmaceutical companies with this. That's a stretch perhaps, but, um, and they get quite cheeky in the representation of, of acid, but it becomes really difficult for police to cramp, clamp down. And the heat is on the psychiatrists who've been pushing psychedelic psychiatry to come up with some solutions for how to manage this problem, so-called. Public health discourse changes dramatically. So this is a, a public health put out, um, film put out by the uh, NIH in the United States, LSD Insider Insanity, and I'll, spoiler, they think it's insanity. Um, and there's a whole bunch of really like outrageous uh, film clips of people like talking about jumping off of buildings and then looking, uh, they have images of brains and they show holes in them. And this had to later be retracted. It turned out to be completely fabricated. But nonetheless, this powerful imagery kind of comes into people's living rooms and splashes into newspapers, suggesting that psychedelics are in fact horrendously dangerous and highly risky. In 1971, Richard Nixon, president of the United States, of course, um, declares a war on drugs and singles out Timothy Leary as the most dangerous man in America. Um, I talked to Larry's archivist who said that at that time, Larry had been charged with a bunch of drug, uh, with drug possession for what today would amount to $5 worth of cannabis. Anyway, Canada's a little bit slower um, to respond. They continue to allow for research with psychedelics until 1968. Sorry, I should say the US was 1966. Um, but you can kind of see that this trailing off. All right. So officially, according to the scientific literature and according to the policy piece, this is the end of psychedelics. The late 1960s, we can kind of track different moments when jurisdictions change. But unofficially, the story of psychedelics obviously continues. And coinciding with the introduction of desktop publishing um, and PO boxes and a variety of other ways that people are distributing information, cultivation guides, 
and recipe guides begin to flourish in the underground. And these are just a few examples that I've collected from some informants I've been working with. Uh, the one on the bottom that looks like nothing is this really bizarre but super cool little pamphlet about how to make your own LSD at home. Anyway, I just thought it was really fun. Um, and there are a few people who are even sort of boldly and bravely staking out their place in the underground. People like the Shulgins, Alexander on the top and his wife, Anne, um, who work with the American DEA and try to sort of stay ahead of the psychedelic rules or psychedelic laws. So they're introduced, he introduced, he's the chemist, he's a psychologist. He introduced over 200 psychoactive compounds to the underground. Many, so he's kind of a, a godlike figure at you know Burning Man um, because he furnished rave cultures with all these different um, psychedelic drugs, including the one that I'm holding there, which is the original vial from Two C Fly. If anybody is up on their psychedelics, they publish stories about this. They publish books about this, urging people to sort of emancipate the chemicals from the plants and learn to do it rogue and on your own. So I suggest then, by way of conclusion, um, that. In order to fully appreciate what's at stake in the psychedelic renaissance, I don't think we can afford to only look to the science or the culture or the policy side, but there's a whole side of psychedelics that has been continuing to operate under these coded in the kind of gray and black market space. And if we are willing to look beyond, uh, I'll pick on PubMed just as a random example, but if we're willing to look beyond the scientific publications, there's a whole range of ways that people are communicating about psychedelics learning about them and making decisions about doses, about how to take them, where to take them, who to take them with, that are not really part of our academic landscape when it comes to that evidence. If we apply the idea of citizen science to psychedelics, perhaps we need to go to Reddit or we need to go to the Arrowwood Vault, which is a not-for-profit off the grid group of people in California who've been collecting experiences about psychedelics um, for kind of harm reduction purposes. And I see that Imperial is beginning to do some of this. They're asking for volunteers, sort of no questions asked, if you have done microdosing, come and tell us about it. And I think this is an interesting moment in our history as academics and practitioners, you know, thinkers in this space for where do we go to look for the kind of evidence that's going to help us make good decisions about psychedelics going forward. Uh, the group at Johns Hopkins recently published this in uh, in JAMA, I think, um, this hype cycle. And so I, I kind of want to pick on it just because it's, it's sort of fun. Uh, there are no dates on it, which as a historian, I find a little bit interesting because I think that this hype cycle may in fact have some merit, but we may have to elongate it from 2000, which is roughly what David Yaden, the lead author on this, suggested it was supposed to be. Um, and we might need to think more broadly you know, about whether psychedelics actually had a hype in the past and that we're now trying to sort of reconcile that past so that this is more of a reconciliation moment than a Renaissance moment. Um, and I put that out there to be a bit provocative. So my conclusions, my final, final conclusions, sorry for going on so long, told you I get excited about this. I think that the psychedelic Renaissance has, a, has real broad implications for how we do science in this in this domain, how we do clinical work in this domain, how we think about the relationship between humanities or storytelling and um, and psychiatry. And part of that is going to come down to, I think, how we develop evidence and what kind of evidence we trust. If we have to go through our public institutions in order to develop that evidence, we know that there are still sort of conservative elements that are suggesting that, you know, we can't do research on this right now because it's a malign substance and whatnot. And we there's lots of examples of that. And you can find David Nutt railing on about that lots. It's a bit of an impediment. And yet people are taking psychedelics regardless of the regulations that would allow for that right now. So somehow I think um, I, I encourage us to think broadly about how we might harness the, the sort of divergent paths that psychedelics are on to think about what this is going to mean going forward, because I, regardless of whether psychedelics are decriminalized or regulated, people are going to continue to take them. And some of those people are gonna land in your clinics. And um, I'd like to see a world in which we can develop some kind of, um, some capacity for thinking about how we integrate psychedelics. I guess I, I'm agnostic about the particular regulation, but how do we start to empower 
uh, frontline workers and teachers and social workers and parents and police officers to begin to think about what it is about psychedelics that we are really you know, afraid of. Um, and I think we need storytelling as much as we need science. So I will end there and thank you so much for your time. Oh, and thank, thank you, Erica, for, for such a wonderful um, talk. Um, we, we've, we've got maybe 20 minutes or so for discussion because um, we started a wee, a wee bit late. So, um, so I, I maybe kick things off if, if that's permissible um, and then people can raise their hands if they want to, to come in. I, I sent you that paper from the end of last year Wayne mm. Hall and um, Keith Humphreys, and and it, it kind of you know I'm 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 interested in psychedelic research, but I, for me one of the points is the people trying to research it tend tend to be advocates of it. They're not they're not they're not coming from a sort of neutral stance um, of well you know the no hypothesis is this won't work, but let's see if it works. In, in terms of the sort of medical research. And I, I think, you know, I feel that with Ben Sessa's work, um, you know, the, the numbers aren't big in the studies. He's an enthusiast without a doubt. Mm -hmm. So, and, and he, he kind of, the psychedelic renaissance, he's, more, he's kind of saying that he's had his own psychedelic experiences and therefore, so you you know is is that a problem? How how do we get around the? Do we do we need that objectivity? Is is this out with the realms of science? Maybe it's what you were saying at the end there. Um, um, yeah, I, I, I'm on the fence about it. I think. Yeah. It's a, such a great question because, you know, I think it's really plagued this space for a long time. And, and sometimes I think it maybe creates a bit of a rabbit hole that we need to step back from perhaps. In the past, um, in, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, I can't think of an example and I certainly wouldn't claim to know, but generally speaking, psychedelic researchers required or expected to take psychedelics themselves. And, you know, it doesn't, it maybe sounds strange if you imagine like being a chlorpromazine researcher or something who's, you know, self-dosing. Um, but if you're a psychoanalyst, it makes perfect sense. And many of these people were trained in psychoanalysis, not just psychedelic researchers, but many psychiatrists at this time had some degree of psychoanalytical training. So it's not so bizarre to imagine that that would be incorporated. And there were drug, there was drug research where the researchers took it themselves as well. And that was considered ethical and appropriate. Um, it's, it's interesting the timing of it though, because that becomes, you know, something that starts to split away with the introduction of, you know, randomization and, and that sort of mantra of objectivity as a way of evaluating risk. Today, I, I agree with you. And um, I think there's still, I think people are quite cautious about how they present themselves. So they want, so some are, you know, Ben Sessa, and I, I would say like a lot of uh, psychedelic scientists or psychedelic researchers in this space are, are kind of flamboyant about their own experiences, um, almost like it gives a kind of credibility. You know, they have more authority because, you know, they did so much MDMA in the 80s that, you know, whatever, uh, you know, that, that's a kind of social capital. Um, and I think increasingly and in small ways that's beginning to change. So the last psychedelic conference I was at in, in uh, September, it's the ICPR Interdisciplinary Center for Psychedelic Research that was hosted in, um, in the Netherlands. Um, it was a very different feeling of the meeting. The meetings I've attended in the past, people are you know wearing day glow colors or like even if they're in suits, they've got some kind of psychedelic tie or just like a symbol that they're cool, right? Um, and as if that's the symbol of coolness. Um, but this meeting was much more buttoned down and there was a lot more uh, sort of objectivity might be too strong, but like maybe we need to actually look at the way that we're producing evidence, which was an interesting moment for me. I think I think that's a really good uh, development, but still there's a debate about whether therapists should have had an experience before they can sit with their patients. And so this idea is not going away entirely, including developing it into um, training protocol. And there are a number of places that are now providing training. There's no, there are no regulations, there's no certification, there's no standardization, but there's a kind of um, sense within the community that you know you need to have a triad. So you need two therapists and a patient, you need certain, you need music, you know, there are a bunch of things. And one of those criteria um, 
understated is you need to have had your own experience and we don't ask how you get it. So it may come to a methodological challenge that maybe is a good challenge to have. And I'm not suggesting that, you know, everybody has to take psychedelics to be able to talk about them. I, I wouldn't be allowed to talk about them if that were the case, but. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm intrigued because, uh, you know, I'm getting on in years. So people who trained me did take LSD, psychiatrists in Glasgow, um, mm. a therapist called Bill McGee. I remember him speaking about it. They, he took LSD, his colleagues drove him to the old, Glasgow Airport and he watched planes taking off, but he had no great insight from that. And I don't I don't think in Glasgow it got particularly used very much. I don't think they they knew what to do with it. But I I mean I give it given your I haven't read into it enough, but your, your interest in the history from the 50s and 60s. There was one paper in history of psychiatry where 160 Danish patients they were, LSD, were given compensation for the damage done by LSD. Now, D David Knott and Robert Cathart Harris wrote a letter to History of Psychiatry saying, well, maybe it was a question of dosage and they didn't really know what they were doing. But, but get, I mean, given in our Hippocratic Oath, those of us who are doctors, there's that bit up at the start, first of all, do no harm. You know, mm -hmm. this, I think this is the worry, the, the unexpected, uncontrolled reactions you might get from, from this therapy. But, but would you say the historical lesson is, you know, the, the, it, it wasn't necessarily a wrong turn and there might, might be something in it? I, I, suppose, I suppose that's where David Nutt's coming from. And, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think it's... I think there's a lot of potential with psychedelics and whether it's the substance, like, you know, whether it's the, I don't think that psychedelics are a magic bullet, but I do think that, you know, trying to figure out how to measure them, or there are a lot of methodological lessons that could become, that could come from just energy focused on trying to figure out what these things are. And that may not end up with, you know, psychedelics being on, getting a DIN number or becoming part of the menu options, but it does, I think, allow for an opportunity to Think about methods. How are we assessing risk? Who do we ask? Like, you know, there were so many people that were left out of those studies, and that's true in, in any clinical trial. Um, but I think it does crack open some of those larger, even kind of existential questions. In the place of palliative care, and it's perhaps not surprising to see psychedelics going into palliative care, that spiritual piece keeps popping up. And, you know, there's certain ways of measuring these reactions that just don't allow for conversations about, you know, the time that you saw God while you were talking to your psychi psychiatrist, you know, or maybe I'm being fl uh, flippant here, but there, I think there are places where psychedelics are also sort of pushing at the edges of what we consider, uh, I know, a payable service, whether is this private care, is this alternative care, and it straddles some of those edges, which might be okay to update our sense of where, where those edges should be, who should pay for them. And again, I'll say this as a proud Canadian, you know, I think it's dangerous to just follow what's going on in the United States, because I think that's a wrong headed model for thinking about access to what we're talking about are, are a lot of vulnerable populations without healthcare um, insurance. Right. And uh, yeah. That's it. <laughs> we throw it open and people, if you're if you're not shy, you can put your cameras on and uh, let, let's let's have a discussion. Um, there's a, a lot of good uh, colleagues. I can see names on the screen here. Um, anyone want to come in? The, um, Gordon, I, uh, yeah. Yes. Well, yeah, good I'm, evening. Yeah, I was just looking at your comment in the chat. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we have to place in perspective um, the, the side effect profile of, well, what people talk about it. And, you know, other would, people would say it very low, but we have to place that in the, in the context of side effect profile of many, many medicines in psychiatry and in medicine and in psychiatry, indeed. And I think a lot of people would say, I think it's how it's used. And if it's used in a control way with two people there, vetting people who might, have side effects like people who are very dissociative. I think one has to be very careful or a history of psychosis. But if one's vetting people appropriately, it's a controlled place where it's happening. I think some people would say the side effect profile is very, very low. I mean, and I wasn't being flippant about the number of people who die from non-steroidal use every year, you know, in the in the United States. I mean, it's it's a huge number. So I, I think the side effect profile 
if it's used carefully and appropriately, and I think it has to be regulated, and a lot of people would think that means not only having a session or two before someone takes it, but within a, a formal, robust psychotherapeutic setting, uh, I, I think the side effect profile is then very low. And I think the, the beneficial effects can be very significant and impressive. Thank you. I totally agree. And um, I guess my concern as a non-clinical person is that somewhere along the way, they'll think, oh, well, this is just like cannabis. Let's make it available uh, here in Canada. I can walk down the street and buy it at a store on the corner. Mm. And my concern mm. is that it's like, well, let's just open the floodgates and treat it like cannabis 2.0. And I think that will move this conversation into a very different place very quickly. Yeah. That, that careful environment won't be there. And Again, yeah. we know that people are going to do this on their own, but you know, there are actually relatively careful protocols. I don't want to call them that because they're not that, but like there's harm reduction that's taking place at, you know, Burning Man or, or Coachella or these big concerts where they have psychedelic mm -hmm. tents where they're like, do you have a buddy? Do you have water? Like, <laughs> it's not that they're um, completely reckless. <laughs> and yet I think creating the, um, the language that says these are okay will change the risks that people are willing to take outside of any kind of controlled space. And, and we're not ready. I don't think we, the world is ready for that. Um, I think things will go off the rails very quickly. Um, yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, David Finlay, you want to come in, David? Cheers, Ian. Yeah. I don't claim expertise with regard to this. My impression is that it has never been possible to disentangle both the psychotherapeutic, almost psychoanalytical strand from the psychopharmacological. So there always seems to have been huge uncertainty about the appropriate methodology. And I, I think, unless I'm missing something, that still seems a, an almost insuperable problem. Absolutely. I mean, psychedelic folks, even in the past, coined this concept of set and setting that, you know, you couldn't do appropriate psychedelic work without set mindset and setting. So thinking about the environment, whether that's the, you know, the, the, the therapists were there, the music playlist, all those sorts of things. Um, and, you know, it's really, we were, a group of us were trying to study, like, so how did they come up with the set and setting, you know, not the concept, but how do they evaluate that, you know, to make it consistent. And it's just kind of an assumption that's brought in here. What we do know is that from looking at historical records, um, placebos just didn't work. People were pissed off. You know, <laughs> there was no sort of placebo for psychedelics. So they're like, have a lot of Benadryl. And they're like, no, it's not doing the same thing. So, you know, go to a sweat lodge. Is that an effective placebo? But then that introduces other kinds of complications when you start to try to disentangle the pharmacological effects from the, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, the environmental effects or the psychotherapeutic effects. And, and I think you're right. That's again, a kind of methodological knot that has not yet been untangled, or maybe can't be, we maybe need different language or different ways of thinking about it to appreciate what that combination of things, what combination of things is going on. I think if I were, you know, the ruler of all funding for academic research, I would give money to people. I think that we have a lot to learn from Indigenous uses of psychoactive plants that would push that conversation in a different direction. So kind of thinking with the culture first, and maybe the science comes in later, or maybe the justification of what's going on in our minds or bodies comes later. Um, I don't see a, a model for that, or I don't see some institutions sort of claiming that space and saying, we're going to create an endowed chair in ayahuasca ceremonies in a really meaningful way. Um, but I, I mean, I, I think we have the tools. I just don't know that we have the leadership or the guts to, you know, actually fund that kind of research or claim that it's on an equal parallel. Thanks, Erica. Any, anyone else wanting to come in? And uh... yeah, I'd be I'd, I'd be very interested to hear what Erica had to say about qualitative research. It's got a a more fancy term to use, but you know, broadly qualitative research, descriptive research. I think that's. Um, should have a far bigger place in, in many areas of psychiatry, you know, trying to understand psychotherapy rather than doing a double blind trial and psychoanalysis, for example. But in this area, is there any good qualitative research? You think it has more of a place? Should have more of a place? 
Absolutely, I think it should. Uh, there probably is some that I just am not on top of. Um, I was just mm -hmm. at an addictions meeting in Canada, our, our national meeting here, and uh, we had a bit of this conversation. And the conversation that, you know, based on the people who showed up to that presentation, so I can't claim that it's you know got any mm -hmm. evidence. Um, but this was the same, a similar conversation, like we need to pay more attention to that qualitative research. And Sometimes, you know, one of the problems we ended up talking about afterwards was, you know, so what grant do you apply for that allows you to put that front and center? And then we all kind of shrugged and said, well, you know, you can't do that as a clinic. Our funding agencies, and I don't know how this is in the UK, but, um, you know, our funding agencies have moved us away from really integrating that beyond a kind of token or you know, like we recognize other people do this. But interdisciplinarity mm -hmm. seems to mean like, I'll bring a psychologist and a psychiatrist into the same room. Mm -hmm. And what we're saying is like, no, we want like an indigenous knowledge keeper and an archivist mm -hmm. and a psychiatrist. And they're like, whoa, no funding mm -hmm. agency mm -hmm. has the parameters for that. That's mm -hmm. kind of a relatively new problem. I mean, 75 mm -hmm. years ago, we had you know funding and now we have all of these different silos of funding. And again, maybe this, I think that maybe psychedelics are an example of where we've kind of splintered away in the way we create evidence and knowledge that might be an opportunity to use this to say, hey, maybe maybe we've gone too far in trying to get sophisticated techniques for isolating things, but maybe we need to think about the integration of knowledge as well. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. no one wants to let me be in charge of all the funding, so. <laughs> <laughs> maybe one day. <laughs> yeah. I was really interested in what you quoted from Osmond about the public health aspects getting in the way of therapeutic research. You know, sit, sitting in Scotland, I'm very aware that our statistics of people presenting to general hospitals because of behavioral disturbance through, um, through illicit drugs, which in, including synthetic cannabinoids, cannabis, cocaine, et cetera, the, the, the presentations had increased 20%. Um, mm. 35 years before looking at last year's figures. So they, these weren't the heroin overdoses or the benzodiazepine overdoses. These were um, psychotomimetic drugs for want of a better word. So I, mm. I, I suppose the fear is if you have too permissive a society and people don't know how to handle these drugs, that there will be public health consequences. You know, in, in Glasgow, I, I treated a medical student who was about to lose his medical career because he turned up in the middle of the night at hospital under the influence of mescaline, for example, you know? And, uh, and of course that goes straight to the General Medical Council, to the university authorities. You, you know, as a doctor, you're not supposed to do that kind of thing. And um, so, it's, I mean, what Osmond was saying is, is interesting from that point of view. You know, once, once the genie's out the bottle, how do, how do, how do you, um, deal with it. And, that, and that's a common story in the history of psyche, uh, psychotropic drugs. Mike, Mike Jay calls it the Frankenstein story. And yeah, yeah. to make the same story around cocaine, you know, Freud, Uber Coca, cocaine's grey, I love this stuff. And, the, and then it falls into disrepute once, once it escapes from the laboratory. Um, you know, the, the drug becomes a menace. And, um, you know, and, and you just wonder, are we going to repeat this endlessly? Or... Um, um, yeah. Well, I think psychiatrists are actually in an awkward position right now because, you know, there's a lot of pressure on psychiatrists to figure out how to solve this. And yet I don't think we necessarily have given psychiatrists the tools to collect the evidence that's necessary to make like an evidence-based decision about this. The example in Alberta is, um, you know, psychiatrists are now the gatekeepers. And I think that puts a lot of pressure on a system that hasn't, you know, none of the psychiatrists who are practicing in Canada today, okay, I shouldn't say none, maybe there's one. I doubt that any of the psychiatrists practicing in, in Canada today had a course on psychedelics or even a lecture on psychedelics. Um, and so I think there's a lot of pressure to create responsibility or liability even um, in a system that's not really well informed right now. And you know that's the Alberta case. Um, there are other examples. And right now, like it's it's mostly down to clinical trials through in other places in North America, or just opening it up, like Oregon did, saying, "All right, well, whatever grows on your land, you can pick and eat if you like it. And if you happen to have a bunch of mushrooms, that's up to you." Now this gets there's other problems with that, of course. Um, but then 
people are still landing in the psychiatrist's office saying, help me. And we don't have, I think, good information about either what people are taking or, you know, why. Anyway, I think this is a, a problematic moment, <laughs> but I see a hand. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll let Chris Dawson in, in a, a moment. I also wonder if Brave New World, you know, Aldous Huxley, Mescaline, and, and then in Brave New World, it's a dystopia where people are using mind altering drugs to keep them under control, you know, so it's like both sides. Chris, uh, Chris Dawson, please. So. Hi, uh, I'll make, thank you for the uh, uh, talk and, and the lovely conversation. I, uh, again, not as an expert, but um, I'll make some points about, I mean, you mentioned already the, the, the context, uh, the, the, you know, it's not just the patient and the substance, but I mean, who is the patient who, you know, with what level of insight or thought are they approaching this, the environment, you mentioned music, for example, expectations, wishfulness as placebo, nocebo effects, and all these things, they're very relevant. And knowing oneself, as Ian, you know, rightly, said, you, know, you know, you know, being wary of one's potential foibles or, you know, and so on. These are things that might have to come into play. And it's, it is safety, but equally, it's not just safety. You know, if it's going to be transformative, that, you know, there needs to be something more coming into it, something that, that allows for the possibility of transformation. For example, I mean, I know you, um, the city in, in, in Greece is going to be one of the um, European um, culture capitals um, uh, that used to host the Eleusinian uh, Mysteries. They had uh, different tiers. They used to put people through their paces, and then only those that managed to show that they were uh, able would come for the second bit and then we'll go through fasting and all these things that I needed to go through. And then they would have the hallucinogens. You know, they wouldn't just, you know, you know, go ahead and, you know, let's see what happens. You know, there is a, a, um, a preparatory phase and then there is a phase after as well. And this is where the, you know, the idea of the, um, you know, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy comes to play. You know, one can have a different view now you mentioned placebo I mean and holotropic breath I mean there's lots of there are other options there are other ways to, you know, yeah. and, and it's not just uh you know a reaction you know there are other ways to 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 rattle the organism if you'd like to to allow different structures of reality to 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 become real it's not just psychedelics and mm. it's not just uh, horrendous trauma, and it's not just breathing differently. There, there are many ways, techniques, if you'd like, that, that will come through. Uh, it, it, and, and it's this about this particularity, about the intelligence of the, um, the group, if you'd like, that would allow for that to come into the individual. And it's not just this kind of mechanistic kind of viewpoint of your X, take the Y, and then Z, will come out so there's something richer that 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 can allow for a transformational experience to to take place and and then there's a difference as well and I think this is where I'm some I mean because I hear all sorts of things from my patients who you know go to these regular London haunts and have weekly or three weekly psychedelic ayahuasca ceremonies or what you know whatever right so there's there's prevalent there's people that go and have it regularly and they're 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 no better for it they're still the same they're still having the same problems, same relationship problem. So, you know, it's not a panacea. It's a way uh, for a group to allow a person to heal and be better uh, in a way that they want to be better. That is, uh, I, that's how I see it. And, and the, there's a difference between having people who are, um, and this is why it's difficult for many psychiatrists to do it, because, you know, we are raised uh, kind of, <laughs> not as free responsible whole persons but on the whole as a tool to a system and then that becomes very difficult for a psychiatrist who's been raised to be a tool to a system to be uh, someone who can help someone transcend from one stage of being to another and, and it's a very different situation so i and these are just some comments that came to mind thank you thank you so much i feel like i would we should sit down and talk for an hour after this but uh I, I'll just mention quickly that I, I completely agree um, with lot everything what you're saying, but um, what resonated was these other ways of appreciating altered states of consciousness 
is something that, again, some research units or some training units are more open and explicit about, and others are like, go and get one of those, and then you can join our program. So there's an application, you know, have you ever tried any of these things? And there's not a lot of questions asked. There's, you know, a checkbox in a sense. Others, I just participated as an instructor um, in one that's coming out of the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto, and they require all of their um, therapists and training to go through holotropic breath work um, as part of the training. Now, this isn't the therapy comparison piece, um, but there are elements that are getting sort of baked into some of these training protocols. What I think is happening though, is it, it's still the wild west. Um, there's not a lot of consensus or consistency beyond recognizing that these things are important, um, that there are a variety of ways of getting to it. So sitting in a sweat lodge, for example. Um, but like, if you say, you know, I went to Costa Rica and I had this experience, you know, does that fast track you through to the top of the list? Or if you say like, I haven't tried any of these things, but I'm really curious. And, and it's, I, I mean, I should be asking these questions. I should be an ethnographer and ask these questions, but um, there are so many new training mod modules coming out. And I know that these are elements of it and some of them are spoken or explicit and some aren't. Um, and, and I think this comes from a combination of the stigma associated with psychedelics from the past, but also this challenge in trying to identify what is a priority in this landscape, um, who's going to fund it. And just for one moment to circle back to something Ian said, I think some of the advocacy or lobbying that we see is also, I, I will say, um, a bit of a byproduct of not having dedicated funding to support the kind of research that might be more objective. If you every time have to get private funding in order to get your trial going, I don't know, I think that's problematic in terms of how you represent your work. Um, and I think we're seeing elements of that as well. Most of the psychedelic research that has taken place in the last 10 years has had some degree of private funding going into it. Thanks, Erica. Ken, do you want to come in? It's just very brief. It's going back to, I think, what, what you were saying, Ian, about the, uh, the genie getting out of the bottle. Um, I'm very puzzled in a way, but it seems to me that uh, I'm a sociologist, so not a psychiatrist, but looking at some of the things on um, the media and so on, obviously all the, all the psychotherapeutic situations are very, very controlled with the music, therapists, mm -hmm. the script. So that the, in a way that I find it difficult to dissociate the, the experience from the therapeutic script and the situation and the context. I mean, it takes mm -hmm. me back to, you know, those sorts of 60s and 70s monographs about peyote and so on. You know, like mm -hmm. people taking peyote in a indigenous context, they would maybe see the god of the cactus or whatever, but a Westerner may not see the god of the cactus, but see something else. So my, my concern in a way is, um, and obviously Timothy Leary as well, he was advocating, he did things in a quasi-spiritual situation. Mm -hmm. um, but what happened in the 60s and 70s was people started taking acid, in a totally uncontrolled environment, um, mm -hmm. had experiences, some of them very pleasant, but some of them pretty, pretty horrific. So my concern with the current research and the popularization is that um, obviously people are taking hallucinogenics, but if it became more prevalent, you would end up with quite a lot of problems of people having basically uh, extreme psychotic experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, over the past couple of years, I've been um, trying to do interviews with people in the underground because, you know, they've had to, they're sort of on the front lines of this in some respects, keeping the lid on, you know, people having psychotic experiences, for example, because they know that that's going to get them into trouble um, as underground suppliers who are already living kind of on the edges of the law, or maybe we'd say just not abiding by the law. Um, and so I'm, I'm drawing from a little bit of that from talking to these people who you know, don't want their names on record because they're still like, they still live in this sort of criminalized space. Um, but it, you know what, I think, I think it's really interesting when we start thinking about supplies as well, because, you know, people are getting supplies from a variety of places. We know, for example, that there are, you know, there were pesticides that were sprayed on some of the mushrooms and they associated, you know, there's a couple of really famous uh, San Francisco based con concerts, Grateful Dead, et, et cetera, 
I keep picking on them because they're literally at every concert where this happens. <laughs> um, I think Janis Joplin was at this one too, but there's one, you know, Hell's Angels showed up and there were all these freakouts and they actually had brought the Grateful Dead. Uh, I'd interviewed the daughter of the road. Um, who said like, yeah, dad made sure that the Hells Angels were there to keep the lid on things and to keep the police at bay because they wanted to manage their own freakouts before they got to the clinics. Although the free clinic down the street allowed for people to come in having freakouts as they called it. And there's a whole network of what they call rock medicine, which was trying to manage some of those things before they got the attention of the police which is interesting, but they also started like internally managing the supply network because the supply network was sometimes introducing things like fertilizer and pesticides on the morning glory seeds or, you know, other things that were making people hallucinate or they're saying, don't take benzos with your acid because, you know, but this was sort of generated organically and not from the public health measures that was, you know, was suggesting take none of this stuff. So I guess all that to say, I would love to see a sort of dive into that. I mean, that that kind of evidence, I think, could be really valuable if we're thinking about what to do with psychedelics going forward, even if they stay criminalized, people are going to take them and having some of this information and making it transparent and open and open up, up these conversations could be incredible um, in terms of just giving us a better awareness of how people have managed this. And of course, you know, supplies are can be tricky. Um, not only the the organic ones that were subject to all sorts of spoiling and whatnot, but the synthetic ones as well. Um, and and when you if you put a piece of paper under your eyelid, do you know how many micrograms of acid are on that, or who did you trust? And I think there's all sorts of challenges there. I mean, this is not unique to um, psychedelics, of course, in terms of supplies, but but it's a it, it presents a whole variety of other challenges. Thanks, Erica. I'm going to allow one last question from Chris or comment, and then we'll we'll wind up. Uh, Thanks very much, Ian. I'll I'll keep it quick. Um, Erica, thank you so much. That was a, that was a really wonderful talk. Um, really fascinating. Um, it, just quick point slash question, I guess. I'm aware that kind of as we've spoken about psychedelics, we've kind of used that term as a kind of as an umbrella term, and mm -hmm. you know, in my mind, they're quite a heterogeneous group and uh, kind of perhaps perhaps unfairly or naively you know kind of I, I I kind of imagine something like psilocybin being relatively you know comparatively much safer less side effects generally better tolerated kind of milder and and you know with compared to something like DMT or or LSD um and I suppose just it was just to think about when when we're thinking about things like I don't know policy and safety and so on do do you think from a historical perspective um you know there is a, a a disparity between these different substances um or in the way that they're being generated now i don't know are they much more comparable in terms of safety and tolerability yeah, you know, there's some good work going on on this topic, um, some of it which was presented at the Netherlands conference. There's a Swiss pharmacologist who's trying to really present that evidence right now. Um, but partly it comes from where the emphasis is on the trial. So, you know, we have, you know, four people have gone through an LSD trial. I made that up. I don't know how many, but it's not very many. Um, and it's like, well, why aren't people doing LSD studies? And then he was showing like applications that people had for doing an LSD trial. And, you know, grant reviewers are saying like, no. Um, so there's also differentials in terms of, again, the kind of narratives that are associated with these. And yet with the psilocybin, one of the things, and it's kind of ridiculous to me in some respects, but it's like, oh, it's organic. So it's better for you, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> that's strange. Um, and yet I talked, I, I stayed, I visited, again, these underground folks. I stayed with a woman who was one of the first illustrators of a pretty famous cultivation guide. And so I, you know, I asked her a lot of questions about mushrooms and I said, you know, like how, well, which ones do you prefer? What's your favorite? You know, how did you come up with this? She's like, oh, they're all different. Every single one's different. And if you have the stem, it's this. And if you have the root, you know, so, you know, people who are, you know, uh, I would say really sort of, you know, very knowledgeable about mushrooms or Paul Stamets, for example, who I've sat on a couple of boards with, he would not say, you know, oh, well, he'd say mushrooms are the best because he walks around wearing one on his head. Um, he's a bit of an advocate, um, but he wouldn't, I don't think he would say like, they are necessarily, you know, better or less risk or anything like that. Um, so I think there is a bit of shorthand that's going into 
the policy directives that are coming out. And we do see psilocybin and MDMA, uh, according to the sort of review literature, those two are getting the most attention and the most um, uh, success, I should say, success in terms of like being approved for clinical trial. Um, so we have bigger numbers there. And I think it's distorting this sense that therefore they're better and safer, maybe, um, but there are no current trials on mescaline right now um, in, in human subjects, I should say. Um, DMT is also all over the place. There are a few real big advocates of DMT, but it it's also kind of, um, it's so diverse and variable that the evidence is not, we're not comparing apples and um, apples here, even when it comes to the numbers that we can compare, if that makes sense. <laughs> Uh, th thanks so much, Erica. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the other way the genie will be out the bottle is through private practice and clinics. So, you know, we, we had a talk in Scotland recently about medicinal cannabis. The very You wouldn't get medicinal cannabis on the NHS, but you, you can get it through private clinics. Mm -hmm. um, not just for uh, intractable epilepsy in your child, but for anxiety, for chronic pain. Um, you know, Ben Sessa, on the back of his MDMA for alcohol uh, disorder trial, I think he's trying to have this in a, a shop in your high street that you might go for MDMA assisted therapy um, for whatever psychological problem uh, and, and maybe for alcohol dependence. So, so the, the, this is a story that's going to run and run, I think. And, you know, what, what, let's see where it goes. But um, can, can I thank you so much? You, you've given up your Canadian lunch hour to uh, speak to us <laughs> in a, a Scottish evening. And um, yeah, no, I, th I think that was wonderful. It was wonderful. We shall keep in touch. We shall keep in touch. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate getting feedback from you as well.